Well, as I got ready to leave Romanticism behind, it occurred to me that I didn't explicitly use the term that art historians apply to the Houses of Parliament built in the mid-19th century on a 12th century model, and that term is Gothic Revival. And as I did explain, it reflected a nostalgia for the beauty, the craftsmanship, and the spiritual certainties of an earlier age, and a certain distaste for modernity. But again, not so much distaste that architects didn't work in what were for the time modern details, such as metal in the roofs and a ventilation tower shaped like a Gothic campanile. Um, here's another famous Gothic revival from a century earlier. In fact, this was the country home of the man who was arguably England's first prime minister, Walpole, and he helped ignite the craze. And where did the English prince regent get the idea for this famous building or monstrosity in his favorite seaside town? Looks to me like the Taj Mahal on steroids. The British were fascinated by their empire in India, and here's one result. The style is actually called Indian Gothic. It didn't really catch on all that well in England, but many buildings in India from the colonial era were built in the Indian Gothic style, and here's an example. Okay, on to the second half of the 19th century. The pace of change quickens rather dramatically. The Industrial Revolution enters its second phase with the rise of industries such as steel, electricity, chemicals, petroleum, the automobile industry. More rural workers took to the cities. Science reigned supreme, and philosophers and social scientists attempted to make every discipline scientific. Darwin challenged religious concepts of creation and human life. Marx challenged the social order, and a rising generation of artists challenged the conventions of academy-approved painting in England and France, where royal academies, or at least in England was the Royal Academy, the French Academy, remained very important. So don't worry about knowing all these early modernist styles. Now we're going to only talk about the first today, for that matter, in this unit. But I thought it might be a good time to explain the term modernism, that it's actually used to describe the intellectual and artistic movements of the late 19th and even more the early 20th century. Much of what we call modern art, art historians call postmodern art, or they pin it with a confusing array of labels, various isms that, alas, we're going to have to learn in upcoming units. So, have you been waiting for the next generation to turn on their artistic moms and dads? Oh, those romantics. They were so sentimental, so given to unnecessary drama. Sure, they were engaged in current social issues. You think of the raft of the Medusa or slave ship, but did they take to the barricades? Or did they, like Delacroix, hide in their rooms and peek out the windows at the unruly masses? Did they get their hands dirty? You may recall that Delacroix was dismayed at Turner's dirty hands, and that was probably just paint. To the realists who succeeded them, the romantics produced art that was just, well, too pretty. It was time for some gritty reality. This painting, alas, no longer exists. It was destroyed during World War II, along with 154 other paintings, when a transport vehicle moving the pictures to a castle for safekeeping was bombed by the Allied forces, that is, by us. But we have photographs of the work, which seems especially appropriate since we're now on the eve of photography's invention. This was actually quite a large painting, nine feet wide, 12 feet tall, excuse me, uh, nine feet tall, 12 feet wide. Why would this scale have startled viewers accustomed to French Academy paintings? Well, huge canvases were usually reserved for the big history paintings that members of the French Academy considered to be the very highest form of art. So, here is an example of a French Academy history painting from the same period. It is even more immense than the Stonebreakers, I'll get it right this time, 25 feet wide, but of course it's crowded with figures. Note that by painting a moralistic critique of the declining Roman Empire, the artist still found a way to work in the ever-popular nudes and sex scenes without offending his audience. It's just history, right? Courbet hated this kind of painting, and in this famous quote, he explains why. So what's he saying in your own words? Paint what you see and only what you see. Courbet is credited with coining the term realism. He was an empiricist. 
Scientists and positivists believed that the only truth was truth that could be tested with an experiment or scientifically observed or demonstrated. Corbet rejected the abstract, the visionary, the theoretical. Art was about painting the world we live in with all its toil and poverty, and there was plenty in the late 19th century or mid-19th century. So what do you notice about this picture, especially in contrast to the Academy painting that we just saw? Stonebreakers is not a sentimental view of country life. This is hard, sweaty, back-breaking work captured in dull browns and grays that echo a life with very few pleasures. Despite its size, the painting contains only two figures, one too young and one too old for the back-breaking work that they're undertaking. So what about composition? Does the painting have a focal point? Well, the two workers are lit by a harsh sun that contrasts with the shadow of the hill looming over them. Yet their faces are hidden. They've been rendered anonymous as they would have gone unnoticed by the upper middle class that dominated painting both as painters and as patrons. Every portion of the canvas is rendered in sharp detail. And this really has the effect of eliminating a specific focal point. All is real. Uh, we have revealing light, but no spotlight, no real drama. It's life under the fluorescent lights, if you will. And actually, everyone does look a little green. Here's another Corbet, this time a portrayal of rural property. Again, unflinching. The woman on the left is exhausted. The woman in the center is holding up a heavy pan. You can see her muscled arm. She lifts heavy objects regularly. The cupboard, or maybe it's an oven that the boy opens, appears empty. This is not a vision of rural plenty. And this is probably Corbet's most famous painting, although it is not on the list. In keeping with his perceived role as a recorder of real life, Corbet based this painting on an actual event, the burial of his uncle back in his hometown. But despite the cross carried by a rather bored-looking attendant, the scene is bleak and unhopeful. It's decidedly unheroic and not, despite the subject matter, especially spiritual. Note the colors are once again dark and somber, except for that splash of color in the center left, which actually has the effect of making the church uh, officials, the priests, look more theatrical than real. Corbet's unsentimental realism bothered the Academy critics, all the more because he had the gall to paint the scene on a canvas that was 20 feet wide. The Academy artists also condemned what they saw as his crude application of paint. Corbet often scraped it on with a palette knife, and Corbet and other realists admired the loose brush strokes of the Dutch painters, and they copied this style. This painting, and sorry I couldn't find a date, gives you a better idea of how Corbet applied his paint thickly. Do you remember the name for this term? Oh, I've already put it up on the slide. It's impasto. So here's another famous realist work that didn't make the cut. I particularly like it, so I'm showing it to you anyway. Gleaning was actually a very unsentimental subject. Gleaners collected the grain left over after the harvesting process. French law protected their right to do this, as the Bible had protected the right of the poor to glean in ancient Israel. Gleaners were the, or the Bible recorded the uh, Jewish law's protection. Gleaners were the poorest of the poor. So this painting reflects the realist preoccupation with social justice and, by the way, the artist's deep religious faith. Millet is important also because he's one of the founding members of the Barbizon School, who gathered in the village of Barbizon outside the forest of Fontainebleau near Paris. Some of them were more romantic and sentimental in their tone than Millet. I've left those paintings off. Uh, but what they all had in common, what is interesting, was a determination to paint nature as the eye actually saw it. So this was, in fact, a branch of realism. They also chose to paint outdoors, en plein air, to use the French term, where they could capture the play of light and color as the eye actually perceived it. So we now see the school as an important precursor of the Impressionists. Stay tuned. But the realist painters weren't just trying to capture the world accurately. They wanted to change as well. I should say realist artists. Daumier, like Hogarth, you remember Marriage a la Mode, caricatured what he saw as the corruption of the elite. But his main preoccupation was the oppression of the urban working class. Remember, we're talking at the time when Marx's works are beginning to hit the streets. 
This lithograph is probably his most famous work, although it's not a required work by Daumier. It captures a really chilling actual event. A member of the Civil Guard, that's basically a policeman, was shot from someone who was standing inside a working class tenement or apartment complex. The remaining members of the Civil Guard stormed the housing block and they massacred its residents. Daumier was a journalist, and his prints were reproduced with the new mass media print technique of lithography. Lithography made mass-produced newspaper art and later photography possible, and so it had a transformative effect not only on the market for art, but even more on journalism. So here is a short, but I thought informative, uh, video about lithography. Sometimes these things are better shown than explained. Uh, here's Daumier's famous rendering of Louis Philippe, the bourgeois king that was brought to power by the revolution of 1830, liberty leading the people, etc. Here he is pictured as a bloated giant. Gargantua is actually a figure from French literature, and he's devouring the riches of his people. Louis Philippe would be overthrown in the revolution of 1848, and the republic would be restored. Then we'd have Napoleon III, then we'd come back to a republic again. French politics in this period gets very complicated. I thought you'd enjoy this. This is one of many Daumier satires of the French salon. He has a lot of funny pictures of people staring at paintings, particularly men goggling uh, Venuses. Uh, I thought you'd like this one. I love this painting, so I stuck it in, even though it's not required. This is uh, Daumier's extraordinarily unsentimental painting of the inhabitants of a third-class carriage. It's oil on canvas, not etching or lithograph, but you can still see that Daumier... Uh, the print artist relies very heavily on line. Daumier in this and many of his works employs a head-on point of view. We'll see more of this when we get to Monet. Some art historians associate this with the rise of photography, particularly photography, portrait photography. Note, too, that we, the viewers, are presumably in the facing seat. So we are sitting in the third-class carriage. Daumier invites us not just to observe, but to participate in the lives of ordinary people. So here's our required work by Daumier. I'm going to come back to this lithograph in my next lecture on photography, but let's talk about it briefly now. Daumier made this print soon after a French court concluded officially photography was art and therefore it was subject to copyright protection. So what does Daumier think of photography, would you guess, and why? So it's worth noting that Daumier had to work hard to convince people that lithography was an art, especially since his works were published in the popular press. I can't help but wonder if there's an element of jealousy here. Did Daumier also worry, I would argue correctly, that photographs would replace drawings as the main pictorial art that appeared in newspapers, put people like Daumier out of work? One of your homework readings also suggests that Daumier might be sounding an alarm about the surveillance potential created by balloons, the drones of their day, right? The reading noted that Nidar's balloon was repurposed by the military during the siege of 1870 when the people of Paris created a commune, very famous uh, socialist government in Paris, that was put down quite brutally by the French army. We'll come back to these questions as we move on to photography.